Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon Kennedy. I'm with the Capital Area Multi-Agency Employee Assistance Program. I'm here with my co-coordinator, Lou Evans. Uh, we're so happy to be hosting this webinar for you. Uh, Wills and Estate Planning, Legally Speaking, which is going to be presented uh, by the Legal Project and Piero, Connor, and Strauss, LLC. Uh, I just wanna give a very brief overview for CAMA EAP. We are a confidential informational assessment and referral service that covers all state employees and their families. Um, if you're experiencing any issues that are impacting you at home or the workplace, we encourage you to reach out to myself or Lou, and we will try to connect you with resources that will help you through whatever situation you're going through. Um, our contact information is on the slide here. Please feel free to jot it down. And if you have any questions about getting the material from this presentation, please reach out. So with that, I'd like to introduce Lori Allen from The Legal Project. Good afternoon, Lori. Good afternoon, Brandon. Thank you so much for your introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for um, this worthwhile presentation on wills and estate planning services in which we have partnered with Pierre O'Connor and Strauss. The legal project has been around for 27 years, and I wanted to provide you with an overview of some of our programs in which we offer to those who are living in the capital region area. Uh, we have both legal representation programs and legal assistance and legal advice programs, um, which are either free or at a low cost service. Our legal representation programs include our domestic violence legal connection program, which provides um, representation services services for matrimonial and family law. We have our affordable housing attorney assistance program, our bankruptcy and credit program, homeowners protection, our wills program, our immigration legal network program, our crime victims legal assistance program, and our legal services for human trafficking survivors. In addition to this, our legal advice programs include our legal clinic program in which my colleague Cheryl Garner here has joined us today. And um, this offers free private and confidential consultation services for anyone um, with any means of any legal issue that they um, need some assistance with. We also have our veterans um, legal network program, a small business legal network program, and our uncontested divorce program. If you are interested or know of somebody who could benefit from any of our programs at the Legal Project, please have them to call us at 518-435-1770. And uh, again, I thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd like to introduce our uh, presentation presentations for this tonight, today's um, program, which is Lou Piro and Aaron Connor. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lou Piro. I'm Aaron Connor. And we are Piero Connor and Strauss, um, law firm here in Albany and in New York City. We're going to talk to you today for about the next 45 to 50 minutes about essentials of estate planning, things that you should be thinking about, that everyone should be thinking about, common themes. We're also going to talk about some changes to New York state law that are impending and being implemented through some of your state agencies. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, including new Medicaid rules. I'll cover the taxes, the tax changes and things that changed and didn't change at the end of the legislative session in 2021 and what we're anticipating for 2022. So we'll talk about the importance of wills and estate planning, core documents that each person should have in their portfolio, trust planning, which is the next evolution of estate planning and why people do trusts, what trusts are, how they work, what the purposes are, and then the changes to the law, long-term care planning, and the most important bullet on this screen, and that is putting your plan into action. Uh, talking about planning, Aaron, is good. Yes. Doing a plan is better, and finishing a plan is the best. So having it complete and put to bed, and I will tell you that it brings peace of mind when you have all of these threads woven together and you can see a picture of something happening, here's how I respond, here's how my agents respond. And we're gonna talk a lot about why now, who is gonna make decisions for us if we can't make them for ourselves. And as we like to say here in our firm and on radio, life happens, are you prepared? 
And hopefully after today's session, you'll be a little bit more prepared to have people in place to make legal decisions, financial decisions, healthcare decisions, and upon your passing, how do your assets get to the next generation? How do you protect them? Make sure they get to the beneficiaries that you want to have, own those assets in the most efficient, cost-effective way possible. And we're gonna talk about how you can protect next generations. For those of you like us who have kids, um, Aaron's are a different generation, a little <laughs> bit younger, mine are 20 somethings, but I look at them and you know, my daughter's getting married, my sons have girlfriends and who knows what their futures are gonna be. Is there a way that you can set it up for those next generations? So their lot is better than yours and their assets are protected in ways that we'll show you can't be done for yourself, but can be done for other people. So we want to make sure that you can appoint the individuals that you need. We want to make sure that you have a plan to protect and preserve your own assets and provide that legacy to your family and secure your family's future. And those are our goals for today. And uh, Aaron, what happens in many cases when people fail to plan? Well, it's a failure, quite, quite honestly. So when you don't have a healthcare proxy, there is a statute that can help out for some people. It uh, doesn't work all the time. If you have a spouse and you don't have a healthcare proxy, the statute will take care of that. But in other circumstances where you have children or siblings, all have, would have equal rights. So you don't really have an agent. Um, if you haven't appointed someone to take care of your financial decisions, you will end up in court. There's no statute to fix that. Um, and it's messy and expensive. And this type of court, what we would be doing is going to get a guardian appointed. Um, you have to file a petition. You have to get other lawyers involved, the court evaluator, and usually an attorney for the alleged incapacitated person. And then you have a hearing uh, within 30 days without discovery. So it's, it's uh, not ideal and it's expensive and it can really open some wounds that won't heal over time. So uh, it's very easy to avoid that. When we're gonna talk about core documents, one of the core documents is a will. And that will will put you squarely into court. Um, the other documents, healthcare proxy power return may keep you out of it, but the will by its very nature to be validated requires that it be validated by court. And we have nothing against judges. Some of them are my good friends. <laughs> we have nothing against the Office of Court Administration or any of those people trying to administer the court system. But as the chief judge of the New York State Court of Appeals has just talked about, New York has an antiquated court system. It's been the same system for many, many years, 100 years. And so there are reforms that they're proposing, but when you subject your family to court proceedings, you're opening up a Pandora's box because you now have litigants who can show up and do things there and that you can't do unless there is that court opportunity. So keeping our clients and keeping you and your families out of court is an essential goal. And these documents go a long way to do that. That's right, but, well, essentially the first three. So these are what we call our core four documents, power of attorney, healthcare proxy, disposition remains, something you might not be as familiar with. It's relatively new in this world. Uh, I mean, it might be 12 years old, but and there are not generally a lot of new documents in our area. So that's definitely a newer one. And a will, which I'm sure most everyone is familiar with, they may not be familiar with the process by how which it works. So a power of attorney, critically important document. Uh, we get all, asked all the time, how old do, should I be to do a power of attorney? Or I don't need that until I'm incapacitated. Well, if you wait till you're incapacitated, it's too late. And we've seen all ages need this document. Um, we recommend it when kids go to college that their parent get a power of attorney and a healthcare proxy. Uh, you, when that, young adult becomes an adult, you lose rights. You lose access to information. Um, if they need help paying their bills, and God yeah. knows most college students need help and paying their Eric bills. Eric hasn't experienced this yet, but I have. <laughs> you know, that phone call, hey, dad, I need some books, or, you know, we're, we're going to go to to Cancun. My friends are going on spring break. Can I go? And I need some money. How do you deal with their bank account? How do you deal with their finances? Things come in, they have to file taxes. If you don't have a power of attorney as a parent at age 18, you lose all of your parental rights. 
Same for healthcare decision making, which we'll talk about in a moment, equally as important. But Aaron, this document, New York just changed its law in June. That's right. So we have a new statute. Again, this is in my career, I've been practicing law for 38 years. This is, I think, the fourth or fifth amendment to the power of attorney statute. And it used to be fairly simple. When I started practicing in 1984, the power of attorney was just a couple of pages and it was relatively routine, but they keep flip-flopping and changing the rules. Now the power of attorney is 14 or 15 pages with a lot of complexity and nuance in it. So do you need one? Yes. Can you do one on your own? Maybe, but there are so many things that go into the power of attorney. Who are your agents gonna be? Do you want agents number one, number two, number three? Do you want them all serving together? Do you want them serving independently or jointly? And what powers do you want your agent to have? They have to sign an oath of office under the newer statutes since 2009, but who is that going to be and what authority do you want to give them? And the one thing that's on the screen there, Aaron, that we see cause litigation all the time is a deficiency in the power of attorney. They're not all created equal. You need to think these through. There are many decisions that go into this document. One of them is, do you want your agent to have the authority to give gifts? And you might think, well, why would I want them to give gifts? Think of it in the context of an estate plan. Someone ages or they have a disability. They need to apply for Medicaid in order to get Medicaid. What do you need to do? You need to move assets around. You may need to create a trust. You may need to put assets into that trust. And unless you have that rider, it used to be a rider, now it's in the body of the power of attorney, Aaron, where do you end up? You end up in court. Uh, we've ended up in court for powers of attorney that don't name a successor, or they only name one successor, and both the named agent and successor are gone, so that's very important. Often, we are on the cusp of a nursing home, or have someone in the nursing home, or we can save money, and we need to move money around, or we need to do some something called a spousal refusal, where we move money to the spouse, and without the rider, when you have assets in one person's name, you cannot do those things. There are many other circumstances that's come up in. And we do, uh, you can do what's called the springing power of attorney, though. In my experience, it's been much more difficult to do that. And that's a power of attorney that only comes to life when you're deemed to be incapacitated. Yeah. So get a power of attorney done, get it done right, get it done with an attorney. Uh, I mean, it's just hard to say that you could really sort through all of these decisions Agreed. and hit the targets on your own. Find an attorney that does this on a regular basis because a lot of attorneys could do a power of attorney, but necessarily don't know the underpinnings of all of these statutory changes and all the things that come up in the context of that agency. And if you're a caregiver, um, many of you may be caregivers for aging parents right now. Think of it in terms of what authority do you need to make decisions for your aging parent and what decision making might be necessary for you down the road. And you, you find out that you really need to have broad authority and you want the person with the power of attorney to have the ability, not the power to do things against your wishes, that's governed by the law, but the authority to do things in your best interest, just as you could do them if you still had capacity. So the next one is the healthcare proxy. Yeah, we see a lot of people have a healthcare proxy if they've gone to the doctor's office, they've gone to the hospital, but that's really just a bare proxy. It doesn't give a lot of direction. It may appoint an agent. You may or may not know where it is or where it's on file. So it's critically important that you do one on your own, naming an agent and a backup agent, and probably a backup to the backup, the successor agent to them. Um, we like to include the living will in one document because Let's be honest, most people aren't carrying around 12 documents with them when they do these things. Uh, the living will gets a lot of directions about what people want and don't want, and, and that's critically important. You still need to have a conversation with your agent about this because not everything can really be contemplated, although our living will contemplates, I think, just about everything. Um, we often hear that people want to come in and do a DNR. Well, we cannot draft a DNR for you. That's a medical document. And more often than not, when we discuss that with someone, they don't want it. And the best document out there to have, if you were concerned about really laying out as many medical decisions on paper for you, is a MULST, Medical Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, which has to be done with a doctor, which is basically a logic tree of, of decisions. 
So your wishes may fall somewhere in that spectrum of just the bare bones. I'm just want to appoint my spouse, my kids as my agent and let them figure it out. They kind of know what I want. Most people want to have a little more direction for their agent in the document. So in the healthcare proxy, as Aaron said, we combine that with a declaration, a living will declaration, which is my intentions with regard to end of life decision making. And I get people coming in every day saying, I want a DNR. And when you explain that, okay, so you're sitting here right now, you're playing golf, you're living life. If you have an incident where your heart stops and they could put paddles on and bring you back to life and you could go play golf next week, would you want to be brought back? And almost everyone says, well, sure. That's what a DNR does. It says, if I code, if my heart stops, don't bring me back. The corollary to that is the living will, which says, if I'm alive, but being kept alive with no quality of life, then I want life support to be withdrawn. And I agree with Aaron that the medical order for life-sustaining treatment is now something coming more into vogue. Doctors actually get reimbursed to do this and have this conversation with their patient. And you can fill out that medical order with your physician, your healthcare provider. And that's a very detailed recitation of the things you want and don't want. We do have a guide that explains each of these documents, the law behind them and how they work. It's our healthcare decision-making guide. We have it available so you can contact our firm and we'd be happy to send that out to you. And this is the one that most people that come into our office have never heard of before. That's true. And like I said, it's a relatively recent document, although it, it can be critically important. Um, and what this document does is appoint an agent to make decisions about your funeral and burial. So a lot of people think either that their healthcare proxy or power of attorney can do this. That's not true. Once you've passed on, the authority under those documents is gone. Uh, you can't do banking transactions anymore. And I, I don't think there are really any healthcare decisions to make at that point. But um, other times people have done it in a will. And wills take a long time or can very well take a long time to get admitted to probate. So it's really not a good place to make uh, burial decisions or funeral decisions. And the one that's most famous for that is here coming into baseball season, mm -hmm. Ted Williams. If you're old enough to remember Ted Williams with the Boston Red Sox, the last man to hit 400, and his son thought that his eyes were worth preserving. Ted Williams had a will that said he wanted to be cremated and his ashes sprinkled off the back of his fishing boat in the Gulf of Mexico. Well. Ted didn't make it to the Gulf of Mexico. His son cut a deal with these cryogenicists in Arizona that when Ted Williams passed, he had a handwritten note from the hospital. Ted allegedly signed it saying that he wanted to be frozen and saved for posterity. And his son thought that they'd be able to bring his eyes back and that the genetics of his eyes could be used to enhance people's eyesight. So Ted Williams now sits in a vat of liquid nitrogen in Arizona, uh, two vats actually, one for his head, one for his body. And that's not what he wanted. That's not what his will said, but his right. will never got there. It happened in this little note. New York enacted this statute 15 years ago. It's a powerful statute. It's legally binding. And the next person in line, the person you appoint as your agent, has to make this decision in accordance with your wishes. And all of the funeral directors and others have to follow it and abide by it. So we use this. It's a comfort to you. It's a mitzvah, if you will, to your family. You're giving them a gift because they now know exactly what you want and don't want. There's no haggling, there's no fighting, and your wishes are carried out. So for your body, you have a healthcare proxy while you're alive. You have a disposition of remains appointment upon your death. We have a power of attorney for finances while we're alive, but that stops upon death. And then we have to go to the will. So I think most people are generally familiar with the will. It's a way to direct where your property goes upon your passing. And you're going to appoint an executor, executrix to uh, guide the process. Uh, you may be appointing a trustee if you're creating a trust for a spouse or a child or a special needs or disabled individual. Uh, younger people need to appoint a guardian for their minor children. And you can do all sorts of things in a will. We create... <laughs> It's confusing to people when we create trusts under a will, as it's not a standalone trust, which we do more typically. Uh, but when you do it through the probate process, which is how a will gets validated, you have court supervision all along the way. So it comes with a general much higher layer of expense because accountings have to be filed, 
receipts and releases have to be obtained, and we have to get jurisdiction in the first place, which is where a lot of wills get tripped up. In upstate, we're fortunate because our courts have come through the backlog pretty well from yes. COVID. Uh, think about the fact that courts were shut down for several months during the initial phase of COVID. They had staff that didn't come back to work, that retirement thing that people took early retirement or timely retirement, but didn't come back after COVID. And so they've had to rehire. And it's been a process to get the courts back up to speed. Upstate counties, what we find is the probate process is now a little bit more controllable, although we have waited months for orders from courts and decisions from courts. Mm -hmm. If you're in New York City or Long Island, I know some of you are from the downstate area on this webinar, probate in New York City right now, New York County rather, Brooklyn, Queens, you're looking at six months to get your will admitted to probate in a routine probate proceeding. They're still working through backlogs that they've had. Nassau and Suffolk County, not as bad as the five boroughs, but still there are delays, inordinate delays. So wills are essential. They appoint executors, trustees, guardians of your minor children, dispose of your assets. And as Aaron said, you can create things called testamentary trusts right under the will. But even those, Aaron, continue on under court jurisdiction. Absolutely. So um, if it's for a minor, anytime you want to get uh, funds out of there. You may have to make a motion, employ an attorney to do that. Uh, again, when they're terminated, an accounting may have to be filed, which if it's over a long period of time, or if, even if it's been over a short period of time, it's a, it's a fair amount of work. Um, there are certain advantages and limited cases to doing a testamentary trust, but for the most part, it's better to do a standalone trust and create downstream trusts. And we're going to, we're going to pivot to that in just a moment, but I just want to recap what all of you should have in your portfolio. And that is everyone should have that healthcare proxy well thought out with a primary agent and successor agents because you never want to run into agents. And as Aaron said, that lands you in court. Power of attorney with maybe co-agents, maybe single agents, but always having successors again. And then thinking carefully through the powers that you want to give to that agent over your finances so that in situations where you're not able to pay your bills, manage your assets, you have someone there with good guidance and the authority they need to do that. Upon your passing or upon your death, you have the disposition of remains appointment that makes final arrangements and appoints an agent to carry those out. And you have a will that takes care of your property, your assets. And it's worth noting, Aaron, that a lot of assets today don't go through probate, not because they're in trust, but because there may be a way to name a beneficiary, a transfer on death account, your retirement accounts uh, with New York State deferred compensation accounts, you name beneficiaries on those. What you need to make sure is that you tie all of those together with your plan under the will. Absolutely. So if you are creating a uh, downstream trust or you're leaving money you know, to a, a person, a spouse even, it may be uh, a loss planning opportunity and a loss protection opportunity. So all those things have to be looked at holistically. So in the end, we're gonna talk about how to effectuate your plan. How do you get started? And we usually use a questionnaire for that, which we can make available to you. We're happy to do that. But that questionnaire pulls out this information. If you do have these documents in place, take them out and review them. Can't tell you how many people come in, oh, I did the will 22 years ago, I haven't looked at it since. And it has all outdated information and people that are dead and moved on and divorced. So you wanna make sure you keep it current. In addition to the documents, look at your beneficiary designations, look at the ownership of your assets. If you have a home, check the deed. If you have bank accounts, brokerage accounts, see how they're owned, are there beneficiaries? And make sure on your retirement accounts and your insurance policies that you have clearly stated the beneficiaries. So the core four documents, with a careful review of all of your assets and all of those beneficiaries, that is a basic estate plan, really comprehensive basic estate plan, because you're looking at all the subtleties, all the nuances, and all the things that could happen. So now let's, Aaron, move on to the next discussion, which is living trusts, because that will, as we discussed, has some drawbacks to it. It does, so it has to go to probate, meaning it has to be filed with court, and validated by that court. And then it has to be open for at least the estate for at least seven months. 
Most estates are open for a year, if not longer. You've lost a lot of planning opportunities, perhaps, uh, if you haven't created downstream trust. And you've engendered a lot of costs to your estate that could be avoided. And you've lost a lot of privacy, uh, meaning that anyone can go look at the probate file and see what's there and what's what. Um, in a trust, conversely, someone's in control the minute that you pass um, or become incapacitated. The assets are in one holding tank. It's much easier. You're not chasing down bank accounts. You're not chasing down policies or other investment accounts. Um, you provided a nice network of people to take care of it for you. Your uh, affairs have remained private and perhaps you've taken advantage of opportunities to create trust for other people that are otherwise would be lost. Now, historically speaking in New York state, uh, New York has been a, what we call a will jurisdiction. Uh, I do things all over the country. You talk to people, attorneys in California will tell you that everybody has a trust. And in California, their probate system has been bad for a long time. Our probate system has just gotten bogged down because of the volume of cases and the volume of work that our surrogates have. Same number of surrogates, one judge in every county. That's it for the most part. And those judges get just overloaded with the amount of work that they have to do. So in New York, what we're seeing is more and more and more people abandoning the use of the court system and going to a private administration of their estate. And the way to do that is with this revocable living trust. And as you see on the screen, there are many different types of trusts. We're gonna talk about revocable and one irrevocable trust done for asset protection purposes. We'll describe to you the differences between them but as you go up the ladder and up the scale, uh, particularly if you have retirement plan assets, trusts become very tricky, but very necessary. So all of these are things that we do in our day-to-day -day practice. And we don't do anything except state planning, elder law, and Aaron goes to court to litigate all those cases that we were just talking about. But that's our whole practice. We have 12 lawyers that do this. So this is what we do. So we're doing these trusts on a very, uh, volume-based basis. We do a lot of trust planning and it's become a staple in our practice. And the revocable trust has some great advantages and a couple disadvantages. Let's talk about the upsides. So again, it becomes a holding tank for all your assets. A revocable trust, you are what we call the grantor, the person establishing the trust, or you and your spouse. You are the trustee, you and your spouse, and you are also the beneficiary. So you're wearing, as we say, all three hats. But what you you do by doing this is you create a holding tank for all of your assets. You want to title everything in here really other than tax deferred retirement accounts because you are going to manage them. You can do whatever you want. You can change things. You can sell things. You're 100% in control of this. You uh, have created a system that are going to keep your assets out of probate, meaning that there's going to be a relatively smooth administration upon your death. You have the ability to create these downstream trusts where you can asset protect what you're leaving to people, which they cannot do on their own. And the, you know, the only downside really to this trust is it's not pr protected for nursing home and home care purposes. And revocable trusts are very easy to conceptualize. You have all your assets in your own name. You simply retitle them into your own name as trustee of your own trust. You don't need a new tax identification number. It's still your social security number. At the end of the year, 1099 still come in your name. You still get uh, your W-2. Your, all of your income gets reported under your social security number. So you don't need a separate tax return. Very simple to administer during your lifetime. But when life happens, when those two events occur, disability and death, this trust is the best protection that you can have. And it will manage those assets and have a trustee to do it for you if you can no longer manage it for yourself under terms that you direct. And there's a big difference between an agent under a power of attorney administering assets and a trustee under a trust, Eric. Well, a trustee under a trust is going to have you know, wider breadth. Generally, if you funded your assets into a trust, your power of attorney is going to have very little to do as a, wearing a power of attorney hat. They may have to talk to Social Security and they may have to talk to the phone or the cable company and they need that power of attorney. But your trustee under the trust is going to have control of your assets. They're going to have more knowledge. 
and you in your trust you're going to kind of direct them on what you want to do during your period of incapacity and then uh, when you're gone where the assets are to go so think about if you did become incapacitated how would your assets be managed and who would they be managed for if you're married you probably want them managed not only for you but for your spouse as well what if you have children who have some dependency on you? They may have a special need or you may still be supporting them through school. You wanna make sure that your trust addresses the needs of all of your dependents. Not necessarily done in a power of attorney. The power of attorney is simply the authority without the controls. The trust gives you both the authority and the ability to control how the money is invested and how it's used. So it gives you a great deal more control during periods of incapacity, and then upon your death, it simply transitions on to the next generation. The one asset that does not go in here is your retirement account, your defined benefit plan, your deferred comp, your IRA. Those assets don't get retitled during your lifetime, but as we mentioned earlier, we would tie the beneficiary designation back together with your trust so that the beneficiaries under the trust are gonna be the same people named in your other retirement accounts and other assets passing by operation of law. So the schematic, Aaron, is pretty simple. Yeah, there you are, the grantor. You're becoming the trustee of your trust. Okay, the beneficiaries can be anybody. They can be your family. They can be other uh, heirs, you know, friends if you, or whomever. They can be charitable organizations. All of that's 100% up to you. And again, you can change that at any time you receive principal and income during your lifetime nine times out of ten you're in control of that again until you're incapacitated or you're gone and this really is it's critical to fully fund the trust and again that's everything except tax deferred retirement accounts and look at that last box there are beneficiaries does your trust have to end and this is an issue that we've become very involved with because over time our practice has morphed and again been doing this for 38 years and over that time period i went from doing almost exclusively wills to doing more trusts and about oh 15 or so years ago started to look at things a little bit differently and said well why does this trust have to end why do you have a trust that you put together and, and put all these assets in and you've created a family wealth transfer vehicle. So all of your family's wealth is gonna pass through it. You may think, oh, wealth, but I don't have millions of dollars. Well, you have a house, maybe. You have bank accounts, you have brokerage accounts, you have those retirement accounts, you have life insurance. Doesn't have to be a million dollars. This trust works regardless of your net worth, and in particular, if you own a home or real estate. But at the next generation, I have three kids. I have three 20-somethings there, and you have two lovely young daughters. <laughs> um, but when those kids inherit, what's life going to be like for them? What will they need? What risks are they subject to? And is there a way that I can protect my children from the risks that we all have, but leave my inheritance to them in a way that they're fully protected? And the answer is the beneficiary controlled trust. So I happen to have a revocable living trust. I've put my assets into that trust. When I die, my wife has the trust and she continues on. When both of us are deceased, then my three children, instead of the trust ending and assets pouring out, it will simply divide into three sections and each of them gets their own beneficiary control trust so that they can manage it for themselves. They can use the assets and the money for themselves, both income and principal, and they can also have that in a way that it's fully protected. So the big one for most parents is, what if I get divorced? Or my children get divorced? Can I protect my assets? Well, much harder for yourself, unless you have a prenup, but for your kids, the assets you leave them in that beneficiary control trust are outside the scope of an equitable distribution. They are separate assets and will maintain that status as separate assets. If they get sued, if they have a bankruptcy, or if they have a health crisis and they end up needing Medicaid to pay for health or long-term care costs, everything you leave them in this beneficiary control trust is exempt. 
And this has become a very powerful tool and a very popular tool for parents who just want to make sure, even if their kids are the best kids in the world, they're ultra successful, they want to make sure that their, their inheritance, what they've worked their lifetime for, is going to be protected. And we talked about, Aaron, that you could create this kind of a trust under a will, a testamentary trust, but then you're saddling the kids with a lifetime of court involvement. Absolutely. Uh, much more difficult, much more oversight, much more a uh, layer of expense, just uh, more ideal to do this in a trust. You can, and if you do have assets that unfortunately go to probate, you can always pick them up and funnel them back here through the use of a pour over will. Again, we want to avoid that, but much better to do this in a trust. Um, and I can tell you in my practice, I've seen money end up in all sorts of places it never was designed to go, mm -hmm. um, you know, to ex-spouses, to uh, people outside of the tree, and or one spouse dies and they leave it to their wife and then they marry the pool boy and it all goes somewhere else, <laughs> which is not exactly where people had intended. This takes care of that because if your child passes on, it automatically funnels on down the bloodline. So for parents, I see the, the sigh of relief when we tell them, yes, there's a way that you can plan your own estate, put your own assets in, and have them go to your kids in a way the kids can fully benefit from them and manage them, but they will stay protected. What that doesn't do, and we're going to talk about in a minute, is long-term care planning for your own self. Right. But let's get the estate tax picture out of the way. Some people call it the death tax, the inheritance tax. In New York, we call it the estate tax. And for New Yorkers, we have an exemption of $6,110,000. Federally, that exemption is $12,060,000. So each individual can pass both during lifetime and at death $12,060,000. That's the number for 2022. It gets adjusted for inflation each year. The annual exclusion gift is $16,000 per person per year. So is there a reason to gift that $16,000 per person per year? The answer is there are probably several reasons. Number one, you want to benefit your children or your grandchildren, help them pay for college education, maybe put money into a 529 plan, all well and good. But is there an estate and gift tax reason? And the answer is only if your estate is over $6 million. If your estate's under $6 million, you can pass it all estate tax free anyway. And the $16,000 per year per person free gift doesn't really have a benefit from a tax perspective. And Aaron, a lot of people get this wrong from a Medicaid perspective yes. and think they have a free gift of $16,000 for that purpose as well. That's right. But this is a tax law exclusion, it's not a Medicaid law. Um, and often, things in the law don't line up. So if you're making these gifts and then at some point you need a nursing home, these come back into the picture and the money may need to come back based on the situation. So um, if you're below $6 million, there really, it needs to be done carefully and with thought about what your long-term uh, care situation is going to be like. So if you do have a large state and you get over $12 million, you're gonna pay tax right now at 40%. I do have to let you know that the current estate tax law sunsets at the end of 2025. So on January 1 of 2026, that $12 million exemption is going to reduce to about $6 million. So then New York and federal will be just about equal. So for people with large estates, gifting now up to the $12 million is what you do. Getting it out, using your exemption, creating one of those more sophisticated trusts in order to carry it out. But for most people, the federal estate tax today is not an issue. I mentioned the New York state tax, 6110000 is the New York state exemption. That also factors up every year for inflation. Two things you need to be cautious about with the New York gift tax, estate tax. Number one, there is no gift tax in New York, but there is a three-year clawback. So if you have someone who has more than $6 million that makes a gift and dies within three years, the gifted assets come back into the estate and get calculated with the other assets for tax purposes. The other is once you get over that threshold of $6,110,000, the exemption that shelters that amount goes away. And when you get to 5% more than that, just 5% over the 6,110, 
you lose your entire exemption and you pay tax on the entire 6.3 or $4 million, which comes out to about a $600,000 tax. So I'll just stop there. Anybody that gets close to the $6 million in New York, you need to do some planning to make sure you don't go over what we call the cliff and end up paying a boatload of tax where you could otherwise avoid the entire thing. One thing that's very important for people to know is that the rules with regard to income tax of retirement accounts, IRAs, deferred comp, 401ks, have changed. And there's now a 10-year payout rule. So the beneficiaries of those retirement accounts, unlike past law where they could draw it down over a lifetime, now they have to draw it out over 10 years. So this has called for some additional planning and doing things like Roth conversions, pulling some of that retirement account out early and buying life insurance. And there are other strategies, but if you have a significant portion of your wealth in those retirement accounts, you need to get a consultation to make sure that the benefits are gonna be stretched and the taxes are gonna be minimized going forward. And Aaron, this is another pivot point. Yes. So this applies just about to everybody. You need to figure out what you're going to do for long-term care purposes when you don't. Um, you, if you don't get out in front of the problem, the options are more limited. They're going to become even more limited over time. So uh, doing this early is really important. All right. I, a lot of people think it's just not going to be me, but odds are it's, it is going to be you, uh, more than 50%, much higher than that. And I think as people live longer and longer, you're going to see that number uh, increase. And so most people can't afford to pay a nursing home out of their own pocket. So you really have to come up with a plan. So the cost right now for a nursing home is averaging about $16,000 per month, per month. That's $192,000 per year. And if you've got that kind of income that you wouldn't deplete assets, God bless but most people don't. So how do you plan for long-term care? Well, long-term care insurance is something that people should consider, life insurance. There's a lot of legislation in this, in this year's legislative session from Governor Hochul. She has a number of different bills dealing with long-term care and aging expenses. The Home Care Association of New York State has a, has a bill because there's a shortage of home care workers because there's not enough money in the system to pay them adequately. And that's both in home care and nursing home care. So all of these things factor in to your planning, because when you get to the point where you need care, you have to ask yourself three questions. Where are you going to be? You know, 99% of people want to be at home when they do this. Who is going to take care of you? Is it going to be a spouse, a child, or is it going to be private pay aides? And how are you going to pay for it? And as Lou said, self-insuring is the way when you pay out of your own pocket, if your income is high enough or your assets are high enough to do this, or you know maybe you don't have kids and you feel comfortable using your assets for this, great. Um, but most people that does not work for, uh, certainly over any long period of time, and of course for almost no one. We do encourage private long-term care insurance where available. We see people insure some of the risk, all of the risk. It's becoming increasingly more difficult to insure all of the risk, but having some pool of benefits out there is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then the middle-class lifeline really is the Medicaid system. And unfortunately, our healthcare system has come down to that. What most people don't know, and when you turn 65, you go through your Medicare enrollment and you think, oh, I've got Medicare, I've got Medicare supplement, or I'm in the Medicare Advantage plan, I'm covered. And AARP does studies on this every year, and it shows that most seniors are totally misinformed with regard to what Medicare covers and doesn't cover, and the big doesn't cover is long-term care. So Medicare doesn't pay for home health aides, it doesn't pay for nursing home care, it doesn't pay for assisted living. The traditional long-term care expenses are uncovered by Medicare, so it comes down to your own income and assets, private paying, or as Aaron said, insuring the risk, or looking at Medicaid. And as you probably know, Medicaid is one of New York State's biggest budget items. It's a federal and state and county subsidized program to make it even more complicated, but it goes through changes and it goes through iterations. And in New York, 
We've had a number of changes over the past years, and we have changes right now on the cusp. Right. So chronic care, which is nursing home care, has really stayed about the same for a very long time. Five-year look back, okay, on all transfers. Um, not some of them, not like, well, I gave my daughter my house for a dollar. That's not a transfer, okay? So that would engender a transfer penalty. And worst case scenario, you haven't done any planning. We can still save about half of your assets the day you go into a nursing home. Where the changes really are afoot is community-based care, okay? A lot of people don't even know that New York has a home health care, uh, Medicaid, you know, long-term care program for homes or for your, at your home. It does apply to some assisted livings, only about three here in the capital district. Um, generally speaking, Medicaid will provide for nursing home or home care, but not assisted living. There are several home care programs. The number, the major program is the managed long-term care program where you pick a provider, they do an assessment, and they come up with a number of hours for you. There's the CDPAP program where you hire and fire your own aides and basically become your own care manager. And the nursing home transition diversion waiver program, which in this area generally requires uh, some cognitive deficiency and you get more kind of supervisory hours because of that. Now, the Medicaid home care program in New York is a unicorn. We speak around the country and when you speak in other states and we tell them what Medicaid provides in New York, you can get up to 24 hours a day of Medicaid paid home health care. You can get that from an agency. New York has a program called the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program where you can actually hire your own children, grandchildren. They can be paid caregivers under New York's Medicaid program. And again, under the right circumstances, you can get up to 24 hour a day care. Well, New York having this very extensive home care program, it became very expensive as, long, as well as extensive. And over the past several years, there have been different legislative solutions to that, basically trying to clamp down on the Medicaid expenditures for Medicaid home care. Well, in April of 2020, laws passed, which implemented drastic changes to the Medicaid home care system. And lo and behold, COVID and the federal government in response to COVID froze any changes to Medicaid that would curtail benefits. So we've had this legislation that passed signed by the governor that has not yet been implemented. It was supposed to all go into effect October 1 of 2020. It did not. Different elements of it were put in place last November. Other elements are due to come online this May. The two and a half year look back, because right now you can get Medicaid home care immediately, transfer assets and apply, and you can get Medicaid home care. That is all coming. We don't have a date yet but we think some point later this year, maybe summer, maybe fall. So Medicaid home care is changing dramatically as we speak. We stay on top of that. We do webinars on a regular basis. We're gonna have a series in March that will educate people on what these new nuances. And the bottom line is they're trying to make it harder for people to get Medicaid, much more difficult to qualify medically and financially both. So if, you have aging parents that need Medicaid, or if you want to learn more about this, now's the time because these laws are starting to be implemented and the regulations are starting to take effect. Um, and so in your planning, and you're on this as a worker and, and you're not in a position yet where you're talking about Medicaid home care, but when you talk about long-term care insurance, do you have it? That's one of the first questions we ask clients when they talk to us in a consultation. If you have long-term care insurance, what are the policy benefits? And Aaron, I would guess about 90% don't know. Yes. They have never looked at the policy since they bought it 20 years ago. They're not quite sure what the benefits are, but it's a contract like anything else. So you need to read it. And you need to know what your benefits are under that long-term care contract. And in many cases, people are underinsured or they've lapsed the policy because the premiums became too expensive and they don't have enough money to private pay. So how do we protect our assets? if we want to set up the plan where in the future, if anything did happen, if life happened and we needed long-term care, how would we qualify? And that revocable trust that we talked about is great in so many ways, but I mentioned there are a couple of shortcomings and this is one. Whatever's in that revocable trust, 
for Medicaid purposes is still yours. So if you did need a nursing home or home health care or assisted living, everything in that trust, the revocable trust, still belongs to you and is still counted by Medicaid. There is a different type of trust that is irrevocable that can be done. We call it the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, and it works like this. You would transfer assets into the trust. Unlike the revocable trust, we recommend that you choose someone else as your trustee. For many people, this is children. It should not be your spouse or yourself. It could be a brother, sister, niece, nephew, friend, anyone but yourself and your spouse. The assets go into that trust and you can keep the income. So you keep getting dividends, interest, rents if there's rental property. All of that stays yours. The assets are in the trust and shielded and safeguarded. Someday they're going to go to remainder. So who are your ultimate beneficiaries? Those get built right into the trust. And not only are they going to get it on your death, but we can give the trustee a discretionary power to transfer assets from the trust during your lifetime. So in our case, we have kids. It's pretty easy. My three kids are the beneficiaries. If I set up this irrevocable trust and three or four years from now, I say, well, my car is wearing out. I want to buy a new car. But I don't want to use the money I kept out of the trust in my bank accounts and my IRAs. I want to use the trust money. That's, I have a brokerage account. I want to use that money. My trustee, probably one of my children, would be able to take money from that trust and transfer it out to a child, him or herself, or the other children. And once it gets transferred out of the trust to those children, there is no restriction on what they do with the money at that point. So they could go to Vegas and blow it. They could also take that money and pay for my new car. So they have an option, but we have some controls that we can put over them that make that option not as much of an option as it might otherwise be. So income back to me automatically, principal back to me through my third party beneficiaries, in my case, my children. And this trust then starts that five year clock ticking for nursing home care and ultimately the two and a half year clock ticking for Medicaid home care. And once that trust matures, the assets in it, your home, bank accounts, stocks, bonds, annuities, life insurance, business interests, real estate, all of those things are protected. So how do I maintain my security, Aaron, if I'm a little bit leery of setting up this kind of trust? I know I can keep some cash and bank accounts out. Sure. My IRAs, 401ks. They're exempt for Medicaid purposes, so we would never title them in the name of an irrevocable trust. Um, I would never title them in the name during your lifetime of a trust at all. That's uh, sometimes bad advice people get. But from a Medicaid perspective, they're exempt once they're in payment status. And even if you come to an event prior to being 72, when they have to be in payment status, we can put them in payment status and accept them. But the things that can maybe make you sleep a little better at night when you do this quote irrevocable trust are, you can always change your trustees. So if your relationship sours with your trustee or you somehow picked a trustee who is not doing the right things, you can change them. You're fired, that's how you do it. You fire your kid, <laughs> that's just the way it goes. Uh, some people have problems with that, some don't. But if your child, and this is where most people, I trust my kids, but those in-laws, those damn in-laws, mm -hmm. and I don't know who's whispering in my daughter's ear, my son's ear, and what they're gonna do. If that should happen, you can remove them, but that's a little stick, you know, because that's work being a trustee. There's a bigger that's stick. That's right. The bigger stick certainly is you can change their share. Uh, you can cut them out entirely if you want to. You may diminish their share or increase their sibling share or any other <laughs> punitive things that you may want to do or you know, that just need to be done. Um, but the biggest thing and the, maybe the hardest thing to understand is even though that this is an irrevocable trust, we draft it very carefully so it can be revoked at any time if it needs to be. New York law is very wonderful that way. Other states have similar laws, but under the Estates, Powers and Trust Law, Section 7-1.9, section near and dear to our hearts, that irrevocable trust becomes revocable. And all you need to get is the consent of the beneficiaries. And remember, you have the right to change beneficiaries. So I don't think I need to say any more, but you have a significant amount of control over that trust, even though it says on its face that it is irrevocable. And the assets in that trust are fully protected for Medicaid purposes. So 
we can't emphasize enough getting out in front of this. Don't wait till the situation arises, till you have the crisis, till you're in the hospital or you've suffered the stroke or you've been hit by the car or in the car accident. Get a plan in place now. Start with the core four, if nothing else. Consider trust planning. If you have that option and you have assets that you want to protect, consider the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust at the appropriate time, the revocable trust at the appropriate time. But getting it done brings peace of mind. Absolutely. And laws change, and they don't generally change in your favor. So uh, you want to get it done under the rules as they are currently constructed, as we told you, home care uh, strictures are changing. So when you get in under the old rules, it's always better than the new rules. But I want to thank you in advance of that for joining us today and for allowing us to bring this to you. I hope it was worthwhile and valuable.